very long, and quite honestly, it's not going to be very difficult to go through. Uh, I do have a question that I don't really have fully answered in all my study throughout the week yet for it. Uh, actually, it's been the past like two weeks I've been in this, but um, anyway, so finally, all right, this is written by Apostle Paul while he was in prison uh, during his first imprisonment, uh, believed to be that it was while he was in Rome under house arrest. Say again? Oh, it's right after Titus. Uh, so, if you get to, like. Yeah. Only one, only yeah, it's not, not very long at all. It's easy to miss because it's, depending on how your layout is on your Bible, it might be the same page as something else. Okay, awesome. All right. So this was written by Apostle Paul, uh, written to a gentleman by the name of Philemon. Uh, now, this would have been written uh, while he was on his first imprisonment in Rome, and at least it's thought to be during his first imprisonment during uh, while he was in Rome, along with some of the other uh, epistles that he wrote while he was in prison during that time, which would have been Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. Uh, and in particular, if we look towards the verse 23, it's believed it were, speaks there of Epaphras saluting him. And then um, it's thought to be that he would have been one of the gentlemen that would have been, hi, good morning. He would have been at the church at Colossae. Now, Colossae, if you recall, um, was a church that was started believed to be by Epaphras. Certainly he was what was called the minister there, or the, or the pastor there. Uh, but Paul actually never went to Colossae. I can work here. Good morning. Thank you. Please no. Okay. Uh, we are in finally the Okay, so church at Colossae started by, believed to be Epaphras, uh, who he was the pastor, uh, and it would have been Paul under Paul's influence. Uh, now, Epaphras believed to have been saved during Paul's ministry at Ephesus. And so he goes back to his hometown. Colossae brings the gospel there. People get saved. There's a church organized, and then he writes to them uh, just because of realizing, oh, wow, okay, these are brethren over here. They need to be encouraged. And so in particular, now, um, when he writes, there's good, this is dealing with a personal issue. Uh, this isn't really anything uh, that is outstanding necessarily. Uh, as far as doctrinal, but other, this is really particularly just a personal issue that he's dealing with with this gentleman named Philemon. We know that he is a property owner, and we know that he probably was wealthy, uh, though that's disputed as far as the degree of wealthiness. Uh, but he had slaves, uh, at least one slave, certainly. Um, and then it's uh, we look here, verses 4 through 7, the first three verses are basically introduction. Um, you know, Paul, prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dearly beloved fellow laborer. Okay, so this gentleman uh, was a fellow laborer with them. Uh, grace to you, peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon, uh, oh, excuse me, thank my God making mention of thee always in my prayers. And here is Paul's prayer for him. Uh, hearing of thy faith and love, or excuse me, of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Okay, so he wants that 
his faith communicates effectively. Uh, he wants in, uh, not just uh, Philemon's in particular, but that would be his desire that you see that uh, as something that is a common theme throughout Paul's other writings. But we see that he mentions in particular that he wants his faith to be something that when he communicates it, that it would be something I should want. He communicates it effectively. All right, now, effective communication of your faith, effective communication of your faith, what would that be in particular? You guys are welcome to answer. You guys are awesome. Say again? The gospel. Okay, that would be, yeah. That is one because that is the foundation of your faith, is the gospel. Probably saying uh, living a life of faith that produces other Christians. I mean, just effectively producing other believers. Uh, that could be as well. I guess I kind of technically would fall on the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if you want to summarize it, you could just say, okay, gospel, which would be evangelism, and then you would say Christian living, which would be edification. Mm -hmm. so you would have both wings. In other words, effective communication of your faith. Um, our faith isn't just limited. I mean, the foundation for it, obviously, is the gospel. That Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, uh, according to the scriptures. Hmm. And what the significance of that is, is that, okay, I have freedom from the penalty of sin and the power of sin because of his death, and then I have new life because of his resurrection, and I can now live the will of God for my life. And he spends a good deal amount in the New Testament addressing things that are very practical as far as our lifestyle. Um, you know, let him that soul steal no more. Uh, as far as not only that, but the things that we would say, uh, that, you know, no, no corrupt communication proceeded out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. Um, and you can go down the list as far as like a number of uh, great detailed things as far as how our life affects people so that when uh, I communicate my faith, not just, okay, witnessing to somebody, but also the fact as far as how I live, that the impact of that would be effective on somebody's life. Okay, the fact that, yes, okay, I share the gospel. I'm not denigrating that because obviously that's needful, but as far as when I don't lie, uh, when I'm honest, when I'm seeking to be a servant that lives the, as unto the Lord rather than for eye service, okay, that would distinguish me from a great number of other people that I would work around. Uh, so that that would be a challenge to them. Now, they, they may not always be immediately receptive. Uh, they may want to attack you. They may, you know, cuss you and those kinds of things. Um, but the effectiveness of my, uh, of that, that would be equally as much uh, communicating your faith. Uh, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, and then that, the, the effectiveness of that is something that Paul is desirous for. Because the thing is, if we are, uh, says in First Corinthians that uh, not only just not communicating that with love, uh, that we're as a tinkling brass and a sounding cymbal, or sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. In other words, we're, we're, we're just a lot of noise, and so it makes it, you know, hard to receive, because um, then they don't see beyond us. They, would, they don't see Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody has an issue with Christ and it takes a personal uh, affront against Christ, they're obviously going to have a personal issue with you, or they're going to take it up against you. They're going to, they can't do anything to him, so they're going to lash out to who they can't lash out to, which is you. Uh, but the fact is, that doesn't mean that it isn't effective. Ultimately, God's, God, God's the determiner of that, but he wants your faith to be effective. And then, uh, verse 8 is where he makes his plea. This is Paul's plea. Uh, he mentions his prayer to him, and then he makes a plea. And this is really the, the whole point of the of the letter. It's just one simple point. He makes a plea for him. Of, he says, okay, uh, verse 8, 
Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee, that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I would rather beseech thee, being such an one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was unto thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, okay, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that, that is my own bowels. And then he also mentions this, that whom I would have retained with me, that in my stead, or that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be, as it were, of necessity, but willingly. Okay. Um, and then verse 17 is, uh, is where he reiterates the same plea. Basically that, if thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. Um, verse 12 and verse 17 are really where the plea stands. Is that he's asking for Philemon to receive his former slave that ran away from him. Uh, and he says, just take him back. Take him back. Uh, now I know it seems kind of silly, but like, why would, he, why would Paul... Uh, it seems that Onesimus, it says in verse 10 that he's begot him in his bonds. Okay, so if Paul's in prison in Rome presently during your first imprisonment, that means more than likely Onesimus doesn't specifically say why he was in prison, but he was imprisoned, and during his imprisonment there was somehow able to communicate with Paul. Paul reached out to him. Uh, he's born again. And then now he is changed in his character. Uh, you see, he's developed enough spiritual maturity to where he's. he's uh, Paul says of him that he's profitable to him. Uh, and then he wanted it even so much so uh, to keep him to minister to him in place of Philemon, who it seems that Philemon at some point had ministered to Paul to some degree. But rather, he said, "Okay, I want to. I'd like to keep." Onesimus, but I don't want to do so uh, and put a burden on you. Um, I would rather that you make that decision rather than just going ahead and do so and then place a burden on you. Um, and so that the benefit of that, of his reward that he's going to gain for the labor of the Lord, uh, would be something that you would receive because you gave up a willing heart. You said, okay, look, let my, my slave Onesimus uh, ministers to you on my behalf rather than just go ahead and taking him. But it seems okay that Onesimus is somebody that uh, was unprofitable in the past but now is profitable because he's not only been, we're in Philemon, I'm sorry, we're in the book of Philemon. Uh, been unprofitable in the past, he is now profitable because beyond just the fact that he's born again, he's actually actively trying to live out his faith. He's actually actively living for the Lord. And then there seems to be a previous issue that he needs to deal with. And this is the issue. He's wronged Philemon and he uh, there needs to be a restoration in the relationship. He sends him back, and then Paul also makes a promise here, uh, verse 18, starting at verse 18. Um, if he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, basically if he owes thee anything, put that on mine account. That's interesting. Okay, I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest to me even thine own self besides. And then he, this is just kind of reemphasizing on his plea. He says, Dear brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. You know, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. So, Paul makes a plea to him, and he also makes a promise. Uh, Paul's plea, receive Onesimus again. Okay? And then Paul's promise is, 
if he's wronged you in any way, if he's made, uh, if he's, you know, caused you any harm, then I'll repay it. If he owes you anything, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the one that repays it. Now, here's my question on this debt. I haven't quite fully settled. Um, his relationship needed to be restored because there was something that was wrong. Okay, in other words, Onesimus did something wrong. He's born again now. Now, you would say, okay, that's under the blood. It's been settled by the blood of Christ. Why would he need to go ahead and return to Philemon, to his master? You know, doesn't Jesus forgive sin when you come to him, right? Yes. Yeah. So why is it that he would have to go back? Well, there's the verse. There's a verse in the Bible that says, you, if someone, if a brother has something against you, go to him and resolve that and then come and pray. I don't know. I totally did not quote that properly. But you know it's verse I'm referring to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, as I, yeah, Jesus mentions it as far as if, uh, in, in, in Matthew. Well, it's actually not just in Matthew, but I'm thinking particularly the one in Matthew where he mentions, you know, if, that, if, you, if, uh, if you bring your gift to the altar, then, you know, if you have a against anybody, that your father in heaven is not going to hear you. Right. And um, the thing is, he's already been being effective. I mean, it seems God's already using him and blessing him oh. since he's before his restoration. It could probably affect Philemon's relationship with God, having the bitterness, unforgiveness. <laughs> okay. Like if when Simus doesn't rectify the relationship with Philemon, maybe Philemon could be grudgeful and it could affect his relationship. How would Philemon know? What? Are you saying he would never even know? Yeah. He still owes the debt. Uh, it's not, yes, he's been forgiven for the, the sin that he committed of breaking his, of leaving, but he still owes the original debt. Uh, erasing the sin doesn't erase the obligation to repay the debt. Good. That's why I have. Um, that and then also the fact is is that he doesn't have he can't he can't grow beyond where he's at this is conjecture on my part but it appears that as Onesimus is growing in the Lord and in his usefulness hey it comes to light that I have a broken relationship with someone in the past. Now, mind you, God, you know, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, as, um, okay, I'm not trying to be funny about this, but, like, God wants to win, <laughs> you know, those broken relationships. Okay? So, in other words, now, it happens to be that it's against a believer, uh, and in particular, a believer that Paul has relation with. Um, but even if he had been an unbeliever and someone that would have been, I guess, terrible boss or a, ter or a terrible master. The fact is God would want to win him. And so he needs those relationships to be restored in order for God to be able to go ahead and bless and to use it for him to be able to grow and develop beyond where he already has. You know, God wants to do that. He, he He's not willing that any should perish, but that all men should come to repentance. He's drawing all men unto himself. Okay? And that puts an obstacle in God's work in somebody's life uh, when you have broken relationships. Now you can't control how they're going to respond, but you can control how you respond, and you need to basically step out to do right. And so this is Paul's mindset on it. Um, the question I have, I guess, was in regarding this. Go to Exodus 22. Go to Exodus 22. Uh, 
Exodus 22, uh, verse 1. Okay, if a man steal an ox or a sheep and kill it or sell it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for sheep. Uh, verse 2. Uh, if a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he died, there shall no blood be shed for him. Uh, if the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him, for he should make full restitution. Uh, if he have nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. Okay, if the theft be certainly found in his hand alive, whether it be ox or ass or sheep, he shall restore double. Okay. Uh, verse 5, okay, if a man shall cause a field or a vineyard to be eaten and shall put in his beast and shall feed in another man's field or the, uh, the best of his own field and of the best of his own vineyard, uh, shall he make restitution. Okay, if a fire break out and catch in thorns so that the stacks of corn or the standing corn or the field be consumed therewith, he that kindleth the fire shall surely make restitution. And um, this is basically the law. This is God giving the law. This watch is Moses giving the law. But um, these are ordinances obviously concerning theft and thievery. Okay, if a man shall deliver unto you his neighbor's money or stuff to keep and it be stolen out of the man's house, if the thief be found, let him pay double. Now it's interesting as far as some of the things that he gives. Uh, for this particular, if he's found with, with stolen goods, it's he pay double. Uh, with the vineyard, he shall make restitution. So it seems one fur, one fur. Um, and then the, with the fire, full restitution. Okay, if you're found with the material, verse 4, as far as that you've stolen, he shall, make, he shall restore double. Um, but if, okay, if you kill an ox or you steal an ox, but you kill it or you sell it, so you make a profit off of it, anything that you made a profit off of stolen goods, then as far as oxen are concerned, it's five, and then you got four for the sheep. Um, we, can, we can go on over here. Okay, so we, we see that the law obviously accounts for thievery, uh, for stolen goods. And then it also accounts, uh, if you want to go to Leviticus chapter 6. Okay, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Okay, if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord, and lie unto his neighbor in that which was delivered him to keep, or in fellowship, or in a thing taken away by violence, or hath deceived his neighbor, or hath found that which was lost, and lieth concerning it, and sweareth falsely in any um, of all these things that a man doeth sinning therein, then it shall be, uh, because he hath sinned and is guilty, that he shall restore that which he took violently away, or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten, or that which was delivered him to keep, or the thing um, lost which he found. Okay, or all that which he hath uh, sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle, and shall add the fifth part uh, more thereunto, and give it unto him whom it uh, pertaineth in the day of his trespass offering. Okay, now so he has to bring not only just the item, restore the item, but he has to also, uh, in addition, there's uh, there's um, There's an increase of a fifth that needs to be added to it. I can't think of the actual technical term. I'm sorry. Um, and then beyond that, it has to be done on the day of the trespass offering. So in other words, you come before you'd be able to go to God to, to worship, you'd have to be able to go ahead and get that settled. Okay, so that, that's standard as far as uh, what, the, what the law deals with. So we know, okay, this is what's being asked Onesimus to go back to Philemon uh, but here's the thing. Um, Paul says to Philemon, take him in and basically receive him. And Paul says, if he's wronged thee, or if, he's, if he owes you anything, then I'm going to repay you. you know? 
and then he, he brings up the fact that you know you owe me a lot as well by the way how do so, you how do, how do even owe Paul? Uh, we don't actually know that I would assume probably just because of having heard the gospel I'm assuming it, it doesn't you you know I don't really see an account in Acts as to where you have finally even mentioned or you have interaction uh, the only thing you can go through would be uh, Epaphras would be the connection uh, which Epaphras would be mentioned in, in Colossians and then we know that Epaphras received the gospel and took it back to Colossae Col uh, Paul actually never went to Colossae so anybody that would have been a Colossae and received the gospel would have been through uh, the mediary of basically uh, Epaphras. He was he was the one that was a faithful minister to them there. Um, but we do mention it, it is mentioned that he's a fellow laborer. He's refreshed his bowels. Um, the idea there is basically he's he's he stirred his heart. In other words, he's somebody that has been a blessing enough so enough to him to where he's he, it refreshes him. Um, but I, I guess here's the question: He is asking him basically to kind of release him from the debt. Now since the law specifically addresses the fact that he used to restitute and it's very clear that you know restitution should be made because uh, you can't have just an offense just going off and being done without you know restoration of the relationship through that. Why is it? Well, go to Luke 19. Go to Luke 19. We'll see an example of this. Luke 19. It's turning at verse 1. It says that Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, uh, which was a which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press because he was little of stature. Then, in other words, he couldn't see him just because of the amount of people that were there. And then he ran before and climbed up to a sycamore tree to see him, for he was, um, you know, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down for. Today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received them joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that was a sinner. Okay, now, we know historically publicans would have been Jewish individuals that at this time Rome was the governing authority uh, in the country. And they basically would have been considered, I guess, traitors to Israel because they worked under Roman government, in particular as a tax collector. Okay, So they're being beyond tax, whatever they would have had under Israel, which I'm not sure if that would have been, um, I wouldn't say absolved, but the, in other words, if that would have still not have been valid, but certainly you would have had to pay uh, to, to Rome. And beyond that, usually most of the times there were thieves uh, so they would tax beyond, so that, that they were crooked. So they would take beyond what was already uh, uh, necessarily required, so that they could have for themselves. And through that, he's he's become rich. Uh, we'll see we'll see we'll see that brought out here again. And then Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man. By false accusation, I restore him fourfold. All right. In other words, this is he's, he's referring back to the law as far as Levitical law, Jewish law. I am going to make restitution, and I'm going to do fourfold beyond just what I restore, and I'm going to give of the half of my goods, which he's already really rich, and going to give it to the poor. Um, and here's what Jesus says about it. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to thy house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. And then, you know, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, I know it seems kind of silly, but like, why would he say, okay, this day is salvation, come to thy house, when Zacchaeus makes that declaration? Is he repentant? Put his faith in Christ. 
Well, he did, yeah. He did put a faith in Christ. Yeah, he did. He repented. In other words, I'm a thief. i got to make this right. Okay, that was genuine. And so he goes and makes declaration, half my goods to the poor. Anybody that's wrong, you're free to make claim, and I'm going to restore you fourfold for that which I've taken unjustly. All right? That's fine. Now, with Philemon, he's being asked to basically take him in and forgive his debt load. Even though that's specifically not mentioned, that's implied because he tells him, if he owes you anything, put that on my account. Just take him in, receive him. The law demands he, have, he restore. I mean, it's common sense, and it would be just, it would be right. Why is he being asked to just release him from a debt when it's the right thing for him to restitute? I mean, it's not wrong for Onesimus to come back and to actually pay back. <clears throat> Would it be? It's what the law demands. But he's being asked basically to be taken in. Now, Paul is the one asking this, mind you. Is he asking him to release him from the whole debt or from the additional charges of, because he fled? Read it here. Um, verse 12, Okay, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him. Just take him in. Verse 17, Okay, if thou count me therefore as a partner, receive him as myself. Okay, and then verse 18, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee anything, lock, right, put that on my account. Okay, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. So he expressly says, I'm taking that just at face value as far as saying that he says, you, if he owes you anything. The breach is in that he left. The, the breach in the relationship is that he left. He abandoned him. You know, he's a slave. He's, not, he's really kind of under obligation to, to remain there. No, we're not. We're, well, I guess we could. Well, we're not going to have time for that. <laughs> I was going to say we could address this to whether or not slavery was, a, you know, a just system, which it isn't. But the fact remains, nevertheless, that that's what they were living under. Um, but he asked him, take him in, take him in. No less, take him in as myself. And the expectation is that. Um, Uh, verses 15 and 16, and it says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Okay, so in other words, he's now profitable, he's beneficial to you. You would take him in, and beyond the fact that you would take him in because he's a profitable, beneficial servant, is the fact that he's a brother beloved. So he would almost be basically as an equal, in a sense. But you take him in, and if he owes you anything, sorry, go ahead. So, so there may be other reasons, but one reason that I can think of of why he would ask him to do all that is that it's an example of what Christ did for us. He, he took all of our sin. You know, he didn't. You know, he gave us forgave us of all of our debt, not just you know what we had at the moment or you know what was in our past, but he took care of all of it and. It wouldn't model that as well if he only took some of Philemon's things and said, You don't owe me that, you still owe me this. He has legal right, though, even under Levitical law. Well, sure, sure. I mean, yeah. does he not have what? legal right to send us to hell? Of course he does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Good point. 
But yeah, okay, it models Christ. It's going to be something that's modeling Christ. Now here's the thing, okay. How do we make that determination in our relationship with them? I mean, because this is set as an example. Mind you, it's not just randomly thrown in here. What kind of offense would require, okay, this is acceptable because this is not just legal, but it's right. And it's beneficial for them as well to, to restitute as to where, okay, we, we can just forgive this, even though I have the right to go ahead and demand. But, yes, sir? Yeah, no, no, yes, yes. Um, I think uh, that people don't do much rest restitution. They, uh, I think it's good for people if they can do that. But it requires humbling yourself, and a lot of people have a lot of pride, you know, and they feel like they're tearing down their image, you know. But uh, actually, you're not, because you're being honest with them, and they can see that, and you're being a better testimony when you do make retribution. Uh, go to go to First Corinthians six. Well, actually, First Corinthians five. First Corinthians five. That is a good point. Because you don't want to, at the same time, just excuse to where people are flippant and think, okay, well, you know, God will forgive me. You know, they should too. And it's, it isn't very often that you see that. Um, but it, it, it is... Um, Sorry, it was six. I always get those two flipped around because you start off. Six is dealing at the end with the fornication, but I'm always thinking six starts off with the fornication as opposed to five dealing with the, <laughs> the, the okay, so six verse one, uh, first Corinthians six verse one. Okay, there are any of you having a matter against another, go to law um, before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if you shall judge the world, uh, or if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Okay, know ye not that ye shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Okay, if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set up, um, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. It is. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why not, or why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Interesting. Okay. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud that and that your brethren, uh, know ye know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived from neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abuser themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And you know, such were some of you in your but you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And he's later uh, going to turn the argument to fornication and that we're bought with a price. Okay, now he mentioned something also here. When you're dealing with brethren, okay, going to law before, not necessarily, he could have done that. I don't know that he necessarily would have gone to law. Philemon would have gone to law with him. Um, I mean, I don't whatever, it's conjecture on my part, I don't think he would have done that necessarily, but he mentions here that if there's an issue, you guys handle it internally, and then uh, if you're not able to do that, you know, have somebody 
basically that would be a third party that would be brethren within the church to be able to go ahead and handle that and be judged between y'all uh, so that and preferably somebody that would be least esteemed <laughs> that would be you know if nobody likes the determination or judgment then they could be like okay oh, well whatever we don't think highly of them anyways but nevertheless he mentions here something that's interesting he says that um, you go to law one before another and that before unbelievers Okay. Now there is therefore utterly a fault um, among you because you go to law one with another. And then why do you rather take the wrong? And then why don't you suffer yourself to be defrauded? Okay, obviously nobody likes to be defrauded, nobody likes but the testimony factor, um, and I think that plays in part as to what would be a um, issue where you can just go ahead and forgive. Uh, and then where you can just go ahead and demand restitution, the testimony factor, uh, not only just what's right, but also how it stands before unbelievers, what would be best reflective of Christ and Christ's love and Christ's holiness in it. Uh, so Philemon teaches us also one in particular, um, when a brother has wronged you, or you have somebody actually that's wronged you, uh, they come to know Christ. Um, you could, I guess you could demand of them restitution, it would be right. But if you're going to exhibit Christ's love, then you, Paul here makes a plea for him. Receive him, and then if there's anything that's been wrong, I'll repay it. So in other words, you, you can have the restitution, but the restitution there as a demonstration of the love of Christ and uh, of God's goodness to us in salvation would be something that you could go ahead and demonstrate as well. Um, Alright, does anybody have any questions? Yes. So, so you seem to be indicating that you think it's a uh suggestion or something that could be done but not necessarily a requirement via these passages? Um, I, I, I think I would agree if that's what you're saying because, I mean, like Zacchaeus, he, he, he restored. That. Yeah, and Christ didn't he actually say So he's not saying that's not a possibility or something that should be required at times. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I, I say that for this because there's no hard and fast with what he says here, that this, this should always be done. And this know. passage of Corinthians also, you know, even though it talks about them, you know, just let yourself be defrauded, like, just, just lose out what you're owed back. Because of the testimony factor. Right. Because of the testimony factor, but otherwise... But it also uh, goes on to say, you know, have someone in the church, you know, resolve the dispute. But and presumably yeah. the, result, the resolution is... Okay, you owe this much, you need to pay back this much. Yeah. And also he mentions in particular <laughs> Ephesians, uh, let him that sold steal no more, but rather let him work with his hands willingly that he may have to give. So in other words, it's the, the, the thief's not absolved necessarily. You know, if you were a thief, or that's something that's a tendency, or a leaning in your character, uh, you know, God calls... God calls you to change on, on that point. But yes, I would, that would be. Okay. Um, okay, next week we're going to be looking at proofs of the resurrection, and then following that, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, one, one blood by Ken Ham. Right, so we're dismissing.